Hello everyone, this is Historian Explaining, a historian tells you why everything you know is wrong. These lectures are on SoundCloud, iTunes, YouTube, and other platforms. I hope everyone is doing all right, entering now into the second half of our Annus Horribilis. I have not posted for a few weeks, and I'm back now because I have been researching King Arthur and the Arthurian cycle, as I promised earlier. So this will be the first of a series of lectures on the myth of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. I'm not sure exactly how many there'll be. It'll be at least two. We'll see how long it takes to go through this whole story, which is so rich and complicated. But the last one will be on the question of whether or not there was a real King Arthur, or as scholars would say, a historical King Arthur. And that one will be for patrons only on Patreon. So if you want to hear it when it's finished, please go to my Patreon page. The link should be in the description and become a patron at any amount, even a dollar. So I'm going to begin my discussion now of King Arthur, the figure from myth and legend and the stories that have accumulated around him. How to introduce King Arthur? Arthur obviously is an icon, and he's an icon in the sense that he is such a familiar figure and character that he needs no introduction. So what can one even say? Everyone, I'm sure, who's listening right now, who understands the English language, has heard of this legendary noble king of the Britons who famously fought against the Saxons and created a kind of utopian society centering around his glorious court at Camelot. And probably most of my listeners can right away call up associations with images, stories, and characters connected to him, whether his sword Excalibur or the wizard Merlin or his wife Guinevere or, as I already mentioned, the Knights of the Round Table, the Holy Grail. Arthur and his mythos have been enduringly popular in all media, from poetry to drama to prose novels to painting and film, all the way through the centuries as these different media have developed. He is successfully carried over from one to the next to the next. And indeed, my own impetus for choosing to focus on this topic right now was that I saw that a new movie about Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, simply called The Green Knight, was scheduled to come out this spring. But of course, it has been delayed due to COVID-19. So Arthur has an incredible staying power as a figure of both high art and popular entertainment, lasting for well over a thousand years. And this, I think you really have to say, is exceptional. Exceptional in the entire history of art and literature. There is no one who has evolved and endured and remained really in popular consciousness so strongly as King Arthur. For this reason, I think we have to acknowledge that Arthur does not just serve as a kind of easy focal point for a lot of colorful stories, but that the stories of Arthur and the Round Table capture something, something that speaks to people about human strength and frailty. It speaks to the longing for a good society, a utopia of one sort or another, but also the fragility of these sorts of dreams and high ideals. And in this way, I would speculate that the legend can help to account for why the real world that we encounter every day is so often unsatisfying. And in this way, I would say it's the greatest romance. It's the romance of all romances in the sense of a story that allows us to travel in imagination to a different world, a world more exciting, more meaningful than where we really live. But rather than get deeply into that kind of cultural, psychological, literary criticism, let's talk about how this has happened. How is it that Arthur, a possibly real, obscure monarch from Dark Age Britain, 
How did he rise to this incredible, iconic stature? And how did this rich and evocative mythological world get assembled around him? Well, obviously, the Dark Ages, as I said, are very mysterious. There's a lot of gaps in our knowledge. And so they provide a sort of convenient blank canvas on which to project the images and stories that we want. But nonetheless, this did not happen quickly. It took many centuries for the Arthur cycle to develop and to take the shape that we know now. They did not simply emerge directly out of that tumultuous period back in the 6th century. And a lot of what we think of as essential to the Arthur story had to be added in through the Middle Ages and sometimes even in more modern times. So we cannot simply say, let's begin with the facts. That's not how this story came about. It had to be constructed from many different materials through the ages. So to begin, rather than talking about the earliest references or stories or writings about Arthur, I want to begin with a literal icon, the first known pictorial portrayal or depiction of King Arthur. Now, one might suppose because King Arthur's story is always linked to the island of Britain, you might think that that's where the first known picture or two-dimensional portrayal of Arthur would be found, perhaps, say, an illustration in an illuminated manuscript from some British monastery. But that is not the case. Where is this earliest known depiction of Arthur? It's found in the Cathedral of the Annunciation in Otranto, in Apulia, the southeastern corner of Italy. The Cathedral of the Annunciation is a medieval church in a fairly plain Romanesque style, common at that time. It's balanced, dignified, but basically unremarkable as a building, except the enormous, elaborate mosaic floor, which is in fact the largest mosaic in Europe, and was put in place between 1163 and 1165. And if you look at this richly decorated and illustrated mosaic floor, it centers around an axis, which is the tree of life, the trunk of which is laid out running up the central aisle of the cathedral from the entranceway towards the altar. And arranged around this tree of life are biblical and historical scenes and figures, such as depictions of Alexander the Great and his conquests. And you can see the mosaic floor as a whole as a kind of depiction of the entire known mythology of the people of Otranto at this time in the Middle Ages, arranged out schematically or symbolically. Near the top of the tree, closer to the altar, one sees scenes from Genesis, such as Adam and Eve cast out of the garden and Cain and Abel. And tucked in among these Genesis characters is a figure of a crowned man riding on an animal that seems to be a goat with cleft hooves. And this crowned man on a goat is labeled Rex Arturus, King Arthur. So for one thing, how did King Arthur end up on this mosaic floor in Otranto? Well, in those years in the 1160s, Apulia was held by Normans. French fighters and colonizers of originally Viking extraction who spoke their own dialect of French. And these Normans had come down into the Mediterranean and used Apulia in Italy as a base to attack Constantinople. They had an ongoing dispute with the Byzantine Empire. And then again, in the 1090s, they used the port towns of Apulia as bases to launch their forces on the First Crusade. So these crusaders around the end of the 11th century were really a motley crew of fighters coming from all over France and the Low Countries. And they brought with them various servants and retainers, including a number of Breton bards. So these are French-speaking minstrels and storytellers from Brittany, the northwestern corner of France, 
which centuries earlier had been colonized by Celtic Britons from Great Britain. And most likely these Breton bards who came down with the Normans into Italy brought with them stories of a man they called King Arthur. The King Arthur figure that they spoke and sang about was pretty much unrecognizable to us today, completely different from the King Arthur that we might talk about now and has largely been forgotten. If we look at this mosaic depiction of Arthur in the Otranto Cathedral, the figure is small. He probably is supposed to be understood as a dwarf. And as I said, he's, he's riding on a goat, which is charging towards a spotted cat. So why would he be small? Well, apparently in Welsh mythology, if we look at Wales as a place where old Celtic traditions and myths endured into the Middle Ages. In Welsh mythology, those who travel to the other world or the, the invisible spirit world and return come back as dwarfs and their ruler, at least according to one story, they're the leader of these otherworldly people, rides on a goat. So most likely, this depiction of Arthur in Otranto is casting him not as a king of an ordinary Romano-British kingdom, but rather as a king of sort of spirit people or shamanic people associated with the underworld. And the cat that he is charging is most likely a representation of the legendary cat monster called Kathpalug in Welsh who, according to certain Welsh stories and legends, comes across the sea, invades Britain, defeats Arthur, and takes his throne. And indeed, if you look just below this figure of Arthur on goat back in the mosaic, you see a man lying on the ground, probably also intended to represent Arthur, with the cat leaping upon him and tearing into his throat. So it seems that the mosaic is showing us the defeat and death of Arthur at the hands of Kathpalug. So what does this mosaic depiction show us? What does it tell us about Arthur? Well, it shows us that many of the stories surrounding Arthur are very strange and fantastical. Many are more supernatural and deal with animals and monsters, more so than we might see or read in modern literature. And these stories of Arthur were circulating very widely around Europe, spread largely by these Breton bards. The Arthur legends are not simply British they are really international European. And as I said, they were spread by these Breton bards, many of whom followed after the Normans in their extensive travels. But nonetheless, even with all of these great differences in the older, earlier medieval stories of Arthur that make them so strange and unfamiliar to us, still the fact of his fall is crucial. This has always been a centrally important theme of the entire Arthur cycle, that his reign is limited and that he does not create a dynasty, but somehow fate or evil forces bring him down. The Otranto Mosaic also shows us that Arthur, even as strange and confusing as his legend might be, he fit, he could be fitted neatly into the existing biblical and historical mythology of the Middle Ages. Somehow his rise and fall fit in the minds of these mosaic artists into the context of Genesis. And perhaps his rule, his wars, and his downfall can be seen to echo the story of the Garden of Eden, this short-lived paradise out of which human beings inevitably were expelled. Now again, these stories, although they were always tied in their telling to Britain, they had tremendous popularity and currency on the continent. And indeed, one could say that this mosaic floor in Otranto was not the first depiction of Arthur that has been found. It depends on exactly how you gloss that word. But in fact, from a few decades earlier, 
archaeologists also found a sculpture carved into the architrave or stone archway of one of the entrances to a church in Modena up in northern Italy. And this sculpture seems to date from about 1130, so a number of years earlier, and it depicts a scene of the abduction of Queen Guinevere, who is being held in a tower with a moat, while several knights from both sides charge in towards this tower to rescue her. One of these knights is labeled as, quote, Artus de Britannia. Now, this label clearly identifies Arthur and connects him to Britain, but it does not specifically say that he's a king. And this is one of the crucial changes in the legend of Arthur, that at some point he started to be referred to as a king, but even at this point, even in the 12th century, it's not always clear whether he's perceived or spoken of as a king or not. So how did this bas-relief sculpture with this figure labeled as Artus, how did it end up in Modena? Well, we don't know the details, but again, there were Breton nobles, not just bards, but fighting knights from Brittany, who lodged in Modena in the year 1096 on their way to take part in the First Crusade. And it's possible that those contacts and relationships created during the crusade expedition may have led to stories of Arthur, including in this case apparently a pretty specific episode being transmitted into Italy. The architrave is also significant because we know that it comes from before the major books and epics telling about Arthur's reign. What the fuck? And we're back. I had to take a break because my power went out, but at least that has been resolved. So as I was saying, these images of Arthur adorning churches in Italy prove that there was some kind of tradition of stories about Arthur passing on orally in Europe by the mid-1100s. And we know that this tradition continued to circulate and develop in some way through the Middle Ages. And for instance, just a while later in the 1180s, an English traveler, Jervis of Tilbury, traveled to Sicily and said that he was told in Sicily that Arthur had an abode in the base of Mount Etna. And this is one of the early signs we have that already by this time there was a story out there that King Arthur was not really dead, but he was merely sleeping in a cave or underground lair ready to return. So all of these stories about King Arthur, his adventures, his court, they formed the core of what would develop into a mythic cycle that came to be called the Matter of Britain. So if you talk to scholars in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, they would say there are three main bodies of mythology that learned people should know. The matter of Rome, which is classical mythology, the matter of France, and the matter of Britain. And this matter of Britain, or the Arthurian cycle, as we might call it now, has evolved dramatically through the years to the point of being almost unrecognizable to what it was as far as we can tell back in the 12th century. And this evolving and really expanding body of myth has always served the particular ideological needs of the time. But nonetheless, something of this core has still persisted and has formed really a thread of connection between the medieval world and the modern world, to the point that now Arthur, I think you could say, is the main symbol and stand-in for what people think of the Middle Ages, or the most positive and hopeful associations that people have with the Middle Ages. So what is this evolution? What are the different forms and developments that the Arthur mythology has gone through? Well, I'm going to go now step-by-step through the main sources for who Arthur is. What did he do? What did he stand for? What was his world? So the earliest surviving references that have been found to some kind of important figure or leader called Arthur are in early medieval Welsh and Breton 
bardic poems. So verse poems that were probably set to music and that circulated around orally through the Middle Ages. But these references to Arthur are very, very brief and ambiguous. There is one brief mention in a surviving poem called Ego Dodden, which was in Welsh and probably was composed in the late 500s, although it's very unclear whether or not this allusion to Arthur was actually in the original poem as it was first composed. And there are other mentions here and there in early medieval texts, but I won't get into those in detail and what they might mean. They don't tell us much about the larger mythology, what would become the Arthur cycle. I'll maybe go back to those a bit in a later lecture about the historical King Arthur. So the first actual discussion and narrative of who Arthur was and what he did comes in the 9th century in a book in Latin called Historia Britannum, or just History of the Britons, written around the year 830. So that means even if we credit the notion that there was an original King Arthur, it was probably around 300 or more years after his reign that Historia Britannum was written. And this Historia Britannum is sort of the first germ, you might say, of the legend of Arthur. And its author is unknown. It's anonymous in it, the earliest manuscripts. But the author may have been a learned Welsh monk named Nennius, who lived in a monastery in northern Wales. That's our best guess. And Nennius most likely wrote it for his patron, the king, King Murfin of Gwynedd. So the, the ruler of a small Welsh statelet in northern Wales. And Murfin wanted to claim the right to rule all of Britain. So this is a massive, ambitious aim for this ruler. And so naturally, it works to his benefit to point to some sort of forebear who also ruled or at least led or protected the entire island of Great Britain. And the Historia Britannum was written at a time when Wales had been militarily defeated by Mercia. So if you think back to my previous lecture about Britain in the Dark Age, by this time, by the 800s, there's a pretty clear divide between the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms that control most of what's now England and these holdout Celtic principalities along the western edge of Wales and Strathclyde and Cornwall. And so Murfin is caught up in this power struggle between Celts and Anglo-Saxons, and he's been reduced to the position where he's forced to accept the overlordship of the Anglo-Saxon kings of Mercia. And he tries to build up alliances with other powers around the Irish Sea, such as Ireland and the Isle of Man, which are, like Wales, are still predominantly Celtic-speaking. And so naturally, it works in his favor to call upon some sort of glorious Romano-British Celtic past to draw together these Celtic allies against their Anglo-Saxon opponents. And the Historia Britannum plays this part of, of celebrating the Celtic Britons as against the Saxons and emphasizing the fact that many of these Celtic societies had become Christian first before the Anglo-Saxons did. And hence, they had a longer history of being civilized and Christianized in their view, as against the Anglo-Saxons who had remained pagan for longer. So the book really paints a positive picture of the sub-Roman age, where Christian Celtic society flourished in Britain. And it's right in the middle of that narrative that we get a passage, comparatively short compared to the writings that would come later. You get a short passage describing Arthur. And the Historia Britannum just calls him Arthur. That's, he doesn't have any further title than that. And it says that he fought, quote, with the kings of Britons, meaning alongside the kings of Britons, against the Saxons. But, quote, he himself was dux bellorum. And that Latin phrase dux bellorum means 
war commander or battle commander. So it's it seems as if the author of the Historia is trying to specifically spell out this leader, Arthur, who led Celts against Saxons, was not a king, but he was a military leader. And it lists off 12 battles that Arthur fought and supposedly won. And for each battle, the Historia gives a location somewhere in Britain. But these locations are all very unclear. Most of them have short Celtic place names that either are just completely lost or that could refer to a number of different places around Great Britain. One of them is described as taking place at simply the City of the Legion, which is very vague and could be any number of places. And in the case of one battle, I believe it's the eighth battle, the Historia says that Arthur rode into the combat with the sign of St. Mary on his shoulders. So there's a clear invocation here of Christianity, of a Christian warrior opposing the pagans. And the whole passage really has strong religious overtones, specifying that there were 12 battles, like the 12 tribes of Israel, and there's phrasing in the passage that can sound very reminiscent of the Old Testament, talking about Joshua leading the Israelites into battle. The 12 battles culminated with a final confrontation at a mountain that it calls Mons Badonis, or Mount Badon. And in this battle, supposedly Arthur killed 960 of the enemy with his own hand. So Arthur, with his victory at Mount Badon, he is able to press back the Saxon incursions into Britain. But nonetheless, according to Historia Britannum, the Germans kept bringing in more reinforcements from mainland Europe. So this Anglo-Saxon tide did not stop. Hence, Arthur's victories did not last for very long. They were still ultimately overwhelmed by these invaders. And as I said, the locations of most of these battles are completely lost and cannot be clearly identified. People try to identify them at different times, including Mount Baden, but it's unclear where they would have been, and it's actually unclear whether most of them really took place at all. The only one that has any corroboration is the final one, Mount Baden, and that battle is actually mentioned in Gildas's History of the Destruction of Britain, which was written about 250 years earlier, before the Historia Britannum, back in the 500s. And as I'll mention later, Gildas does not mention Arthur. That name does not appear in that earlier history, but the siege and battle of Mount Badon does. So that's the only one where we have some corroboration possibly confirming that that was a real event. So the Historia Britannum sweeps through a whole long period of history and involves many figures, rulers, leaders, battles. Arthur is just one episode among many in the Historia Britannum. But most of the figures mentioned in the Historia were soon forgotten and have fallen into deep obscurity. Arthur is the only one that persisted, that people continued to talk about, probably sing about and write about. And there may be several reasons for this. One is that Arthur was more recent. It comes closer to the end of the Historia, so maybe there was more surviving memory about him. He is Celtic. He's not a Roman. He's a Celt, like these Welsh people who would have been reading and circulating the Historia Britannum. He's Christian, so he also has that in common with the audience. And he successfully defeated Saxons. So for all of these reasons, this figure or character of Arthur persists and gets a whole second and third and fourth life after the Historia of Britannum, even as the book really falls into obscurity. You see some elaboration on the story of Arthur start to appear in the 900s, for instance, in the Annales Cambriae, or Annals of Wales, which was written in Wales in the mid-900s. So this is just a very simple chronicle that lists the different important events in the history of Wales and of Britain more broadly by date. So the Annales Cambriae puts the Battle of Baden, which was supposedly Arthur's big final victory, in the year 516. 
and it says that Arthur carried the cross on his shoulders. So whereas the earlier book says it was the sign of Mary, the Annalis says he carried the cross, and so it casts this battle as possibly part of a war for the faith. And furthermore, it notes the battle at Kamlan and says that Arthur was defeated by an opponent called Mordred in the year 537. And further, it says that that same year, 537, also saw a mortality, which can mean a disease epidemic or a famine. And it's possible that that event, that mortality that refers to, might have been a volcanic winter in the 530s. So the Annales Cambrier illustrates several things. One, that Arthur is still prominent at this time, and it's simply understood to the audience of this chronicle that they will know who Arthur is. It puts continuing emphasis on his Christian mission, and in fact does not mention the Saxons. It doesn't say who his opponent was. And if we take it seriously, it implies that there was a 21-year period between his great victory at Mount Baden and his overthrow in 537. And so maybe you can roughly take that as the understanding at this time of Arthur's gold period, those 21 years. Not long after the Annales Cambrier was compiled, a further appendix, you might say, was added on to it called the Mirabilia Britanniae, a collection of miracles in Britain. And in this Mirabilia Britanniae, there is one short passage that seeks to explain a strange, wondrous feature of the natural landscape. And that is a large footprint that can be seen in a rock formation in South Wales. And the passage reads, quote, There is another wonder in the region, which is called Builth. There is a pile of stones there, and one stone positioned on top of the heap has the footprint of a dog on it. When he hunted the boar Troint, Cabal, who was the hound of Arthur the warrior, made an imprint on the stone. So this little passage in Mirabilia Britanniae marks the beginning of writers using Arthur as a way to explain remarkable or otherworldly aspects of the landscape. He starts being, you might say, written into the landscape of Britain. And later in the same book, there is also a second mention. There is a passage discussing a tumulus, or sort of mounded tomb, in the earth. And the author claims that this tumulus shapeshifts. It grows and shrinks at different times on different days. So it's somehow wondrous or miraculous. And the author says that this tumulus is the burial site of the son who betrayed and killed Arthur. So remember the Annales Cambrier also already said that Arthur was defeated at a battle at a place called Camlan by somebody called Mordred. So maybe that figure Mordred is the same person that this later appendix refers to as his son, who became a traitor and killed him. Another important fact about this passage in Mirabilia Britanniae is that it specifically calls him Arthur the Warrior. So there's a clear theme here we can see in these early references to Arthur. He is a warrior and a combat leader, not a king. At least there is no indication still at this point that he was a king. So after this point, it seems Arthur really takes off as a major subject for Welsh bards and poets. It may be that he was already part of the sort of repertory of folk myth before this point, but we know that in the 1000s and early 1100s, he really becomes a major repeating theme. The notion that Arthur was a kind of larger-than-life, powerful figure who protected and maybe ruled Britain in some way starts to be reflected a lot in place names. We start to see Welsh speakers referring to different points around Britain as Arthur's seat or Arthur's oven. Most of these sort of monuments in the landscape that people are noting are much older. Either they're natural geological formations or they're Neolithic, Neolithic tombs and things like that. They almost surely have nothing to do with a Dark Age king. 
But nonetheless, we see them scattered all over, especially Western Britain, where there was still a strong Celtic presence. And significantly, there is a massive set of standing boulders that seem to have been erected around Bodmin Moor in Cornwall, down in the far southwestern corner of England, in an area that was still largely Celtic. And this set of standing boulders was called Arthur's Hall. So we're starting to see a stronger association of Arthur with southwestern England and with being not only a warrior, but some kind of ruler. So if we look at specifically at the Bardic literature, so sort of our next big source after Historia Britannum is Welsh Bardic poems and songs from the 1000s and 1100s. And in these songs in general, Arthur is shown repeatedly as battling enemies, both human and otherworldly. And he seems to be the leader of a sort of warrior band or retinue, which in Welsh would be called a teulu, which broadly means family, but could more specifically mean a clan or a band, very similar to the Latin term comites, which Romans applied to similar sort of warrior bands around kings in the Germanic world. Often these stories and poems cast Arthur fighting against beasts, particularly boars. So the boar hunt becomes a really common episode. Also another instance, as I mentioned before, is him battling the great monstrous cat, Kathpalug. And in a lot of ways, you can see Arthur as very reminiscent of shamanic spiritual figures. And I I talked about this a long time ago in my lecture about witchcraft, that there seems to have been a very common set of shamanic beliefs and practices all over much of Europe. Notions that there were certain special people with the ability to travel across the boundary to the spirit world or the world of the dead and return, and that in doing so, they often rode on animals, battled animals, protected animals. They were sort of leaders of of the hunt and of night battles with the animal world. In many places, we find belief in a sort of god or goddess of the hunt, a kind of Diana-type figure, and... Arthur seems to be roughly in that kind of theme. From the early 1000s, there's surviving one fairly long Welsh poem called Culloc and Olwen. I don't really know this pronunciation for sure. It gets (laughs) very hairy. (laughs) But in this long poem, which is one of the earliest talking about Arthur in verse, A young man named Kulik is decreed by magic to marry a young woman, a sort of giantess princess called Olwen. But in order to attain her and be able to marry her, he must pass tests and trials. This is a common theme in epic literature. So Kulik enlists the help of Arthur, who is somehow his kinsman. And Arthur brings his group of knights to take up these challenges. And the biggest central challenge of the story is they must hunt a powerful boar called Turk Truith, which means the essential hog. And they have to do battle with this magical boar who then turns out to actually be a human king who has been magically transformed into animal form. So this poem is the first known reference to Arthur as a king. And probably this shift has happened where now he's being spoken of as King Arthur because at this time, as we're getting into the high Middle Ages, battle and warfare are seen as a kingly duty. The kings are no longer simply ceremonial, but they're expected now to be military leaders. And so it only makes sense that this powerful general would be a king. From a bit later, around 1100, there's a shorter poem about Arthur, also in Welsh, which translated is called What Man is the Gatekeeper? And in this poem, Arthur desires admittance into a fortress. And in order to gain admittance, he must announce who he is. And he begins to recite the great deeds of himself and his men, including two whom he specifically names as Sir Kay and Sir Bedivere. So these are among the earliest references to specific Arthurian knights. And he lists off various adventures and feats that they've performed, including that they fought creatures called the dog heads. 
So now we've seen, by this point, as this Arthurian literature develops, we see that his opponents include humans, animals, and human-animal hybrids. Also from about these years and a bit later, there are a number of saints' lives, accounts of the lives of saints, particularly in Wales and Western Britain. And Arthur sometimes shows up as a character in these descriptions of the lives of saints. He becomes a kind of stock character. And he's usually shown as very flawed, a greedy or vengeful or lustful king who commits misdeeds, but then repents, sometimes with the help or encouragement of the saint. He then repents. So he's very reminiscent in this way of David, the king who basically offs a love rival in order to steal his wife, but then later in life comes to repent and tries to come closer to God. A major example of this is in A Life of Gildas, which was written about that historian from about 600 years earlier, but this life is written in the High Middle Ages. And in this life of Gildas, Arthur is described as beheading his love rival named Huile and claims that Huile was Gildas's brother. So this gives a reason for a rift and even an enmity, naturally enough, between Arthur and Gildas. And hence, it serves this convenient function of explaining why Gildas never mentioned Arthur. <laughs> <laughs> and this is something later authors would say explicitly. Well, of course, Gildas doesn't talk about author. They had this blood feud. It also explains the existence and backstory of a large stone slab called the Huile Stone, which sits in the town square of the town of Ruthin in Wales. And further, it also includes an element that Arthur, when in a fight, is injured in one knee and hence is partly lame and limps. And this is how Huayl is able to recognize him when he comes into the town in disguise and identify him as Arthur. Now, again, you may remember from my earlier lecture about witchcraft that this is a very, very common theme in European mythology and folklore, which seems to relate to shamanism. When someone is part lame, when their legs are somehow uneven, one leg might be injured, they have a limp, this indicates that they are somehow partly of the human world and partly of the spirit world. They have, you might say, one foot in the grave. And the same sort of theme comes up again later in the story of the Fisher King, who supposedly has one unhealed wound on one leg. The Fisher King doesn't appear in writing until later, but you can see this kind of repeating theme woven into stories somehow connected to Arthur. And I would argue it shows this sort of continuing shamanic background. So after the life of Gildas in the 1200s, a further sort of compendium of folk stories was written down called the Welsh Triads. And they're called that because... They're sort of built on sets of three, three anecdotes, three characters at a time put into verse. The Welsh triads include short summaries and references to stories that somehow involve Arthur, Kay, and Bedivere, but they're just little kind of memory keys. They don't explain in any detail who Arthur was or his knights, but they also bring in other characters that had previously been circulating in folklore and somehow connect them to Arthur and place him at Arthur's court. The most important of these probably is Tristan. So Tristan has his whole story about his love affair with Isolde, which may go back far into Celtic folklore. But in the Welsh triads for the first time, we see him sort of stuck there now together with Arthur. And in this way, Arthur could probably become a sort of peg on which to hang any number of figures and stories and accumulate them into a single mythic cycle. And over time, after the Welsh triads, we see his band, or now his court, his sort of royal court, growing larger. So all of these references I've been talking about have been overwhelmingly, of course, in Wales. But it seems that some sort of folk stories, and we don't know much about them, but something similar was also circulating in Cornwall, that region further to the south at the far southwestern edge of Britain. It seems that there was some kind of folk belief that Arthur was not dead, but indefinitely asleep in a cave. So just as 
there were Sicilians claiming that Arthur somehow abided in this cave in Mount Etna. So similar stories were told in Cornwall. He was said to be ready at some point to return to life, and hence eventually the phrase once and future king became attached to him. Where was this cave? Where was he? There were various places identified all around Cornwall and Wales and even sometimes other parts of Britain. And of course, you know, on the right night or the right phase of the moon, you might get in there and see Arthur and his knights, but then it would disappear. You'd never see it again, etc. In the year 1146, a monk from France named Herman of Laon traveled to Great Britain. In his account of his travels to Britain, he said that there were many places associated with Arthur that were pointed out to him. And he saw one man trekking to the site called Arthur's Hall, which I mentioned before with the standing boulders on Bodwin Moor in Cornwall. And this man claimed that Arthur would heal his withered arm. So Arthur has some kind of magical power now, a healing power. And the monk, of course, got into a fight with this man. As a monk, he maybe doesn't like having competition for powers of of healing. Herman claimed that this was similar to other fights that people had in France as well, specifically in Brittany, that largely Celtic area of France, where people also, as he says, disputed over Arthur. So the story has spread widely and it's grown, it's accumulated, it's taken on new powers. Some folk stories about Arthur began to be written and collected in prose as well in the 1200s and 1300s. And this sort of body of short prose stories has been called the Mabinogion. This means that by the 1300s, there are a lot of these stories circulating all around the sort of Celtic fringe, as you might call it. Western Britain, also some in Ireland and in Brittany in France. But all of these stories apparently are little known or completely unknown in England proper, the English-speaking, largely Anglo-Saxonized zone. We see little to no reference or awareness of Arthur, and they continue to just be short anecdotes or episodes, the sort of thing you might pass on in a moment's conversation here or there in front of a fire. Nothing very elaborate, and still at this point, we see no mention of all kinds of important aspects of what we would consider the Arthur mythos. No mention of Merlin, Camelot, Excalibur, the quest for the Holy Grail, etc., etc. So how did these sort of loose circulating folk stories and tales develop into the sophisticated epic cycle that we know now? Well, that didn't happen until these basically Celtic tales were able to make the leap over into areas where you had more literate people writing literature in vernacular languages, particularly French-speaking France and England. So how did that happen? How did this Celtic folklore cross that barrier and become a literary subject in the French and English-speaking world? Well, one critical turning point that helps to explain this is the Norman invasion of England in 1066. When you have those Normans, who I mentioned before, they, they're over in Italy and they're on crusade. Well, in 1066, under Duke William, they invade and conquer England. And when they do so, they bring with them various servants and retainers. Some of these were Bretons from Brittany, in the western edge of France, and some of them particularly were Breton bards, who were known to be particularly skilled and entertaining, tellers of stories and performers of song. These Breton bards apparently crossed the channel with these Norman conquerors back into Britain, And some of them probably saw this as a kind of fitting revenge, a sort of way to strike back at those Anglo-Saxon enemies whom their ancestors had to flee centuries earlier. And as they did so, they crossed the channel and marched into England, telling stories and singing songs of King Arthur, of this earlier Celtic Christian British king, whom they could point to as a kind of forebear. 
And also, shortly after that, they traveled, as I said, with crusaders, with Norman crusaders through France and even into Italy and other parts of the continent, also circulating and repeating these Arthur stories. But they had a particular impact. They caught on in a number of different countries, but they had a particular impact in France and England, where the Normans and Norman kings came to be rulers of most of Britain and a large chunk of France as well. At one point, even about half of France was under the domination of the Dukes of Normandy. Pointing to King Arthur offered a way to give these Norman rulers legitimacy. It gave them a deeper tie to Britain through Brittany, so they weren't just French foreigners. It gave them a predecessor who connected them to that older British past, even before the Anglo-Saxons, and cast them as more legitimate and more tied to Britain than the Anglo-Saxons were. So the figure and legend of Arthur could be very useful, particularly if he was spoken of and thought of as a king. So this was the context when the first major extended written account of Arthur's rule as a monarch was composed. And this is found in a book called Historia Regum Britanniae, or History of the Kings of Britain, written by a monk in Wales named Geoffrey of Monmouth in the year 1136. So this is really the watershed where Arthur is first called on and put forward as a serious historical figure who should be seen as a kind of founder of Britain as a kingdom. So Geoffrey of Monmouth, as I said, was a Welsh monk. And in his book, he made the first attempt to lay out a complete lineage of all the British kings from Roman times on up almost to his own time and hence to establish the legitimacy of British rulers all the way up to the Norman conquerors. And it contains all kinds of spurious myths, such as the notion that Britain was first colonized by Trojans fleeing from the fall of Troy. It includes other stories that may or may not have some historical basis, like the first account of King Lear and his daughters. And it contains the first attempt to give a story of the life and reign of Arthur, not just a list of a few events like the Battle of Baden, but a narrative, and to fit that narrative into history. And indeed, the Arthur story forms really the culmination and the centerpiece of Monmouth's whole history. Monmouth claimed that his book was not his original, He claimed that it was a translation of, quote, a very ancient book in the British tongue, probably meaning the sort of Celtic Britonic language similar to Welsh. It's doubtful whether he really was just translating or adapting from some ancient British book. Mainly, it seems to be a sort of mashup of materials and stories from the Historia Britannum, the Annales Cambriae, and various other Latin books. It may be that in the mix there, he also drew on some old manuscripts or oral traditions in Welsh, Cornish, or Breton. Also, a lot of it he probably just made up, embellished, exaggerated on his own. So according to Geoffrey, what is the basic story of Arthur? Well, Geoffrey says that Arthur was first conceived at Tintagel, at that sort of fortified coastal outpost His father was a leader chieftain named Uther Pendragon, and Uther Pendragon allied together with the Duke of Cornwall against the Saxons. So it starts from this sort of inter-Celtic alliance against the Saxon invaders. Uther Pendragon was in love with the Duke of Cornwall's wife and has an affair with the Duchess. And the way he does so is magically disguising himself as the duke and hence gaining admittance into the summer palace and into the queen's chambers. And he was able to magically disguise himself thanks to help from a sorcerer called Merlin. So this is the first time we're seeing anything about Arthur's birth or parentage or about Merlin. This affair leads to the conception of a child, and that child is Arthur. And in return for his help, Uther Pendragon hands Arthur over to Merlin. 
and Merlin gives him an upbringing and a training in magic and sorcery. He eventually takes the throne and as leader is able to completely defeat the Saxons and establish a secure kingdom. He rules over a basically high medieval style kingdom with sort of fiefdoms and oaths of fealty and all the sorts of things you'd expect to see in the 1100s. And he's surrounded by a close circle of sort of warrior nobles, not only Kay and Bedivere and Tristan, but others. After having established a secure dominion in Britain, he goes abroad and begins to invade and conquer most of Northern Europe, including Gaul, apparently trying to establish an extended empire. At this point, the Roman emperor opposes him and demands tribute and submission from Arthur. Arthur refuses, and so Rome sends a large Roman army. Arthur defeats this army and intends then to move on Rome and seize the imperial throne. But while he is on this mission, he is betrayed by his nephew, Mordred. So now Mordred is identified as Arthur's nephew. And Mordred seduces and then marries Arthur's queen, Guinevere. So hence usurping his position at home. Arthur then has to return to Britain and confronts and fights Mordred at a place called Camlan. He kills Mordred, but also is mortally wounded himself in the fight. And while he is dying, his body is taken to the mystical Isle of Avalon, where he is laid to rest. So you can see there are elements here, like the battle at Camlan, that clearly resonate with the earlier brief accounts from Wales. They may have been taken from those sources, or he may have come up with them somehow, independently from some other lost source. But all of this clearly serves political propagandistic purposes in the wake of the Norman invasion. And later, the Plantagenet dynasty, who are also Norman French, want to bolster their claim to Britain. And they draw on this book and on the story and image of Arthur to legitimize themselves. And furthermore, Geoffrey of Monmouth adds this further aspect of the story that Arthur went abroad and conquered in continental Europe, including conquering Gaul. This was especially advantageous to rulers like the Plantagenets who had a cross-channel domain, including France and England. And at some points, even some Plantagenets tried to lay claim to the royal throne of France and to be rulers of both countries at once. So all of this makes the Arthur story very convenient and appealing. And hence, it's not surprising that eventually it would make its way and be celebrated and repeated by important people at the Plantagenet royal court. But in order for that to happen, first it had to be in an accessible form and language for people to draw on. A couple decades after Monmouth wrote History of the Kings of Britain, another fairly mysterious poet called Wace translated them for the first time into a form of French. We don't know much at all about Wace, but he clearly lived and wrote in the mid-1100s. He was from the island of Jersey. He says this in his own writings, that he was from the island of Jersey in the Channel Islands, in the English Channel. And so probably he was of Norman extraction and spoke and wrote in Norman. And he wrote a book called The Roman de Brut, which takes large parts of Monmouth's Historia and puts them into Norman French. And he also adds and elaborates on the story of Arthur and expands it even beyond what Geoffrey of Monmouth had said. And he adds certain key symbols, such as his sword called Excalibur, which kind of symbolizes the rightful rulership of Britain. And he also says that the knights of Arthur's court sat around a round table. And this round table clearly is also symbolic So this is the first time that an extended story about Arthur as a king is put into a vernacular language that many people can read and hear and recite. And it becomes very popular. It starts to be taken up as a theme, particularly by French poets. So the the Arthur story makes its way into French first before English. The first major writer who takes up Arthur and tries to develop it into a sort of complete rounded mythic cycle is named Chrétien de Troyes, or maybe at the time it was pronounced de Troyes, 
who was French and flourished between the years 1160 and 1191. So getting right into the height of the Plantagenet dynasty, Henry II. He worked apparently for a patroness, Marie, who was the daughter of Eleanor of Aquitaine and her first husband, King Louis of France. So she's French royalty. And she commissions Chrétien to write extended works on Arthur and his knights and their adventures, which he writes in rhyming couplets. And that's more of the French style at this time, is end rhyme. But these poems have long, sophisticated narrative structures, a lot like novels, with a beginning, a middle, and an end. They're very carefully laid out, and they're molded in some ways upon classical epics, like the Iliad and the Aeneid and Ovid's Metamorphoses. He clearly was a very well-read, classically educated writer. And Chrétien de Troyes makes Arthurian Britain into a kind of perfect exemplar of the ideals of chivalry. So chivalry was coming very much into fashion at this time. There had been knights and horsemen for hundreds of years, of course, but this was now when all sorts of moral and ethical and religious ideals are being built up around this archetype of the honorable knight one who adheres to a code of honor and service, rather than just kind of riding through the countryside, pillaging wherever they can, which was very common in the Middle Ages, who adheres to a sort of code of honor. And the word chivalry comes from the French chevalerie, which just meant the way of the horseman. And that could just be understood to mean martial skills, the activities proper to a horseman. But in the 1100s, it took on more and more of this idealistic meaning. So the Arthur stories become chivalric, and Chrétien is the first to project these ideals of the High Middle Ages back into the Dark Age, 600 years earlier, where they don't really have any place. Chrétien introduces a number of really important central elements that we still associate with Arthur. For one, he brings in the character of Lancelot who may have previously existed, perhaps in French folklore, but this is the first known instance where he shows up in Chrétien's story called Lancelot or the Knight in the Cart. And this is a story about knights rescuing Guinevere. And it seems that in the earliest form of this story, Guinevere is abducted and put into a tower and then is rescued by Arthur, her husband, appropriately enough. And that is what we see depicted in the Modena archivolt that I spoke about earlier, where we see Artus riding in to rescue Guinevere. But in Chrétien's story, the savior is Lancelot, not Arthur. And we begin to see hints towards a rivalry between Arthur and Lancelot, who are best friends and brothers in arms, but who have a rivalry particularly over the affections of Guinevere. So I'm going to leave this story off here at this point, and in part two, Creating Camelot, we'll discuss more of Chrétien de Troyes and the golden age of Arthurian literature in the High Middle Ages, the creation of the first Arthurian romances in English, and how Arthur has been perceived and transformed in modern times. And finally, of course, I'll have a segment on Patreon to examine the question of a historical King Arthur. 